welcome back to uh, SenseMaker session. SenseMaker at Asia are series of conversations that are informal conversations around important topics, but these informal conversations are of academic seminar quality. And we invite people with insight uh, into these specific areas who can contribute and who contribute just not in academics, but beyond academics and also to the point in space of activism. Today, we are joined by Raj Mariwala, director of Mariwala Health Initiative. It's a nonprofit organization in India that focuses on mental health, advocacy, trans, capacity building, and it also supports innovative mental health and community-based interventions, explicitly focusing on marginalized individuals and communities and enhancing women's uh, women mental health. <clears throat> The MHI collaborates with a range of stakeholders in the area of mental health uh, in India to create wider awareness and also bring out the essential concerns and support organizations, <clears throat> which may or may not be organizations at all. Uh, it's one of the few funding bodies that works with collectives and groups. And I think that is one of the most interesting features of MHI. <clears throat> Apart from all of this, and especially because of this, Raj Mariwala has been appointed as an advisor to the Lancet Commission on stigma and uh, discrimination. So <clears throat> before we get into the nitty gritty of the conversation around mental health, let, uh, let us also have a couple of ground rules. The conversation would be for the maximum amount of time that we can have, one hour 45 minutes. We'll try to wrap it up as soon as possible so that we do not impine on anybody's time. Uh, questions may be asked in the chat box after the conversation and when the floor has been opened up by my colleague, Ms. Shipra Agarwal. So with that, and part of my work here is to get everybody uh, introduced to each other and to get to the speaker. So with that said, I'm now going to jump to <clears throat> the only thing that I have to do, ask one question and then disappear from it, to just to listen. All right. So um, mental health and the concern around mental health is something that uh, people in India have started really appreciating. In fact, a very interesting paper was published which used the national sample survey from 2017 to 2018 and found out the average cost of hospitalization for psychiatric and neurological ailments uh, was rupees 26,843. And high mental health care spending was actually pushing uh, families, the Indian families, into poverty. This is exactly what used to happen in 1980s and 90s, and even beyond that with cardiac ailments. Uh, my young colleague, uh, Ms. Agrawal, is going to get into the nitty gritty of it, but I have a question to start off this entire thing, beyond catastrophic expenditure of healthcare. Uh, Raj, you've been uh, working in this space for some time. Marewala Health Initiative is, has been around, if I'm not wrong, for around six years. And the language used on the website is very inclusive. Uh, there is a larger use of context to build in empathy and to build up a research organization which does not uh, depend on the rule of the expert, but tries to be much more inclusive. So, and this is a question. So I am a health economist by training and there is another health economist in this room of much higher expertise than I am, uh, Dr. Bhushan. But I have always wondered around the language of mental health and mental well-being. In English in India now, there is a greater uh, degree of freedom around how you address these issues. But when I look at the landscape of Indian languages, you know, be it Telugu, Tamil, Kannada, Bhojpuri, uh, Maithili, Avadi, so on and so forth, you know, extend it to any corner. Have you been able to build up a conversation around mental health and well being which goes out of the English speaking spaces of India? With this, over to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks so much for having me here. And, you know, you've opened with a very interesting question and one that's actually very, uh, I would say, close to my heart. 
Um, and that's, I think that's part of the reason why we really focus on context so much um, and why also some of our work is actually around what we call culturally different idioms of distress and suffering. Um, and that's simply because, you know, otherwise conversations on mental health, as, as you have pointed out, are very English-based, but also Eurocentric. Uh, now, the moment we challenge some of these, especially the more pathologized ideas around depression, anxiety, uh, we are able to actually break out of that mold and talk about mental health suffering and distress in ways that are culturally and linguistically relevant. So people may say things, uh, you may use the word tanab, or you may say that, you know, I'm, uh, you're feeling irritation in whichever language, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi. I mean, sorry, these are my languages, so I fall back on them a whole lot more. Uh, but what a lot of, I think, research studies as well as work in mental health has found is that when people from India talk about mental health, it's far more psychosomatic. Um, it's not as Eurocentric in the way that there is a very clear mind and body divide. And these are some important things that we must rely on if we are to tr truly address and engage with the idea of mental health support in this country. So you're absolutely right. Um, there is not enough work at all done in uh, languages beyond English. And at the most, then it's Hindi. Uh, and there is a real need for us to start having these conversations far more. And, you know, part of it is to say that we don't necessarily have to have the expert-led translation when we are talking about this, because uh, the very definition of mental health, especially in our country, we need to look at it differently. We need to look at it as a mental health issue. We need to look at distress because that is the relevance of mental health in today's day and age. I mean, I don't need to say it. Everyone knows, you know, there was COVID, there have been food shortages. The situation in Ukraine has caused, uh, you know, a lot of like domino effects. Uh, now, if we are not going to engage and address with that distress, uh, then what is our relevance of being mental health professionals or working in mental health? Uh, and, you know, even if you don't believe this kind of more qualitative plea, uh, research shows that if you lose your job, the chances of developing a mental illness are seven times higher. If you are homeless, again, the chance of uh, getting schizophrenia or being diagnosed with schizophrenia much higher. And then, you know, there are knock-on effects of the same. If you are a homeless woman, obviously, uh, you are more prone to violence on the street. Now, we know that gender-based violence in and of itself can cause anxiety and depression. Um, so, you know, that's the other way to kind of break it down. So, if I have to, like, wrap up, um, yes, there isn't enough in many Indian local languages, but there can and will be if we step back from expert definitions and pathological definitions and look at unique life stressors and distress and especially look at mental health as a development issue. I hope that kind of answered your question. Feel free to Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think now my young colleague, uh, Mr. Agrawal, is going to take over. I have a lot of questions around it. So perhaps I might be able to send you a long list. Sure, <laughs> right. sure. Shipra, over to you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. To start the conversation with Raj Mariwala, I want to ask, how has COVID-19 pandemic changed the landscape on mental health and led to more open conversations about it? Over to you, ma'am. Sure. Please, please call me Raj. No need for any type of uh, okay. anything like that. But yeah. Um, so, you know, COVID-19, actually, not just in India and world over, there were so many conversations around mental health. Uh, part of it was, I think, due to the isolation, due to the anxiety, the panic, the fear that everyone was feeling. Um, and similarly, it happened in India, where we had far more conversations. I think the, the discourse on certain topics within mental health increased in India. 
uh, such as mental health at work i think that was one of the big kind of uh, uh, you know i would say effects of covid uh, but unfortunately we haven't gone much beyond that and what i mean in that sense is we haven't gone beyond very privilege talking about mental health um just as what was spoken about earlier all of these conversations are still happening in english right even with or without covid uh how much did we focus on the mental health of migrant communities during and then after covid what about people who have either stayed behind in the villages or what about grief and loss support uh in rural india i mean we haven't really covered any of that so unfortunately i must say that even though there has been far more conversation on mental health and believe me i think uh, there has been nothing like covid in that sense worldwide to put that spotlight on mental health uh it's still we are still having very limited conversations around it and you know just to give you an idea uh when we first started mh and you're right it's now 7 years uh everyone said please don't put the words mental health in the name of your organization because that very term is very negative and that was 7 years ago so in fact each and every person we spoke to and most of these people who were working in the mental health field said please don't use the words mental health and covid has changed that along with i i have to say deepika padukone created quite a movement in india to make the words mental health okay so covid and deepika of course have changed that uh, but it's still very limited conversations right uh, why are we not talking even if we talk about mental health at work why are we not talking about mental health on the factory floor one of my most favorite kind of conversations is um we're not even talking about the effects of heat uh on factory floors where workers are now working at higher temperatures what does the irritation and the heat uh, you know cause in a worker on the factory floor are ventilation systems changing and some of that research is available in countries like thailand but again we are not really talking about it here um and i think the other thing that covid did was to encourage people who can afford it who can access the resources around mental health to go out and seek mental health services paid but again you'll see that it's limited to you know the mega cities in india or at the most smaller cities not really towns and obviously not villages at all so it's still very uh, i would say tertiary care led as well and you know feel free if i haven't answered this to your satisfaction you can ask me more questions or challenge me i have no no problem definitely um that's okay ma'am uh, so the second question would be what led to your interest in mental health issues in india and what motivates you to continue the work so i mean a couple of things one is uh, i think i'm interested in the psy disciplines what we call psychology psychiatry so psy disciplines as a field um, i did a few courses here and there uh, which is fine but the other reason is that i myself uh, live with a mental health condition and a learning disability now even at my level of privilege at my level of articulation i have access to english as a language um getting a formal diagnosis for me took until i was over 20 years old despite the fact of having gone to different clinics and everything like that now the moment i got that diagnosis i also got the tools that i needed in order to live life to the best of my capacity right how to navigate the world um how to understand maybe the things that i was experiencing rather than experiencing it as faults within myself now imagine that someone with all my privileges took that long so what's happening to everyone else out there and that's you know really part of the motivation of why i want to work on mental health why i chose to work on mental health and finally i really do believe that mental health is an intersectional issue it touches many different if not all aspects of life and if i have to frame this slightly differently i do believe that mental health and engaging with mental health is integral to reaching at least 10 sdgs sdgs 
Definitely. Definitely. So uh, we all know Amitai has funded and supported numerous initiatives. What successful initiative or programs in India have had a significant impact on mental health and so uh, we can replicate or scale them up? Okay, so, um, you know, we, we fund and work on a lot of different programs and we work with a variety of different communities. I think that's why we focus on context. Uh, so, and we do believe that we cannot do a copy paste, okay? So I think my first role when I'm asked about replication and scale is to say that, uh, first of all, I don't think that we can have scale without inclusion, uh, which takes me then to our to the MHI approach, which is when you build systems for the margins, you will cover everyone. But if you build systems for the center, you are never going to reach the margins, right? So I think rather than talking about maybe particular programs, and I may give some examples, but I'll, 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 I'll talk about what really can be replicated and scaled. Um, one is, I think the power of community and being embedded in the fabric of the community. Uh, I think the role of community workers, whether they are paid or whether they are voluntary, and we have programs that do both, these are critical, okay? Because people who live and work in the communities that they serve, know the fabric of the community, they know the issues that are facing that particular community, right? It's not like, uh, and you know, the comparisons are made to physical health. So I'll just take an example. Now, if it's physical health, I can go into a village, I can run a BP camp, I can run an eye camp. Now imagine the same thing happening with mental health. If I take a psychologist or a psychiatrist into a village, that is really not going to work. No one is going to show up at that location, that tent. Um, and the engagement has to be far more contextual. So for example, there is a program that uh, we support and we have partnered on uh, that works in the Usmanabad district in Maharashtra. Now it's a drought prone district. It's also a district where uh, there is a very high number of farmer suicide. So what we have done and what our partner has done is to train all the young people from that district who are going to agricultural colleges to do some basic mental health support, to do some awareness building around distress and suicide. Now these youngsters go around to different houses, share some awareness building, some warning signs, some basic coping mechanisms and a helpline number. Now that helpline number is called whenever a family member thinks that maybe the head of the family or someone else in the family is in distress or the person who's distressed themselves. Now that person is given support, but if need be, the person is also linked to free psychiatry services. And the third thing is whatever psychosocial stressors there are related to drought, maybe related to getting produced to the market uh, without depending on extractive middlemen or pricing issues, or even figuring out which welfare benefits that farming family can access. The same team does that as well, because it's not enough to just provide mental health support. The linkages are key when it comes to providing mental health support. So the community worker knows uh, what the issues are in that particular region to that particular context can link not just to more expert mental health services, but also other services that will help in engaging with the mental health of the person who is distressed or the family that's in distress. So that's a very critical example of things that can work. Uh, and I would say the, the main factors are really being steeped in that community, knowing what the issues are of the community and being someone who can be trusted as part of the community and obviously someone who is able to communicate in the way that that community communicates. I mean, now I'm just connecting this back to the first question. Language. Yes, language, the way that, you know, there are so many dialects also, right? We are not just talking about language. Like I, I just, again, from my context, uh, my Gujarati is far more an Ahmedabad type of Gujarati than 
a surti gujarati person will be and you know sometimes i find the way that they speak very different from me and i may not even understand it yeah. right so that's what i mean when i say really being steeped in that community uh the second thing that i spoke about which is linkages to psychiatry again the first question spoke about the costs and how accessing healthcare itself can push a family further into poverty one is the actual i don't know the actual paper but one is accessing that particular healthcare and paying for it the other thing is the maybe the 3000 or the 5000 that it takes to go to the district hospital lose a days worth of pay you know pay for that medicine so you know the we find that the more a scalable the services the more it is linked to now government provisions by law uh the the dmhp which is the district mental health plan requires that a psychiatrist sits at every district hospital in the country and not only that that psychiatrist should be dispensing a certain schedule of medications free of cost now there are two problems here one is uh, lots of community members may not know that this exists and may feel too intimidated to go and find it in a town <laughs> the second thing is that many psychiatrists don't actually sit there because uh, there are some demand issues for the very reasons i uh, you know shared just a second earlier right so how do we how do we tackle this a program that we partner on in gujarat uh, called the atmita program it runs in 600 villages in the mehsana district similar to this mm -hmm. there are champions in each village uh, who will talk about mental health and there are linkages up to the psychiatrist now because there is a clear demand because there is a clear linkage and because there is a clear way in which to i would say uh, allow people to help to support people to access the psychiatrist the government psychiatrist is sitting there the government psychiatrist is ensuring that all these medications are available there mm -hmm. right so both sides are being accessed and that's one of the ways in which we can push government to actually provide psychiatric uh, support in all district hospitals it doesn't exist right now uh, for the reasons again that i shared but that's the other way to do it right you're linking you're uh, actually doing this jigsaw puzzle where you are fitting into the government services as well because in the end in india i think mhi believes and so do i the only way to really reach scale is to obviously go via government services right so that's the other kind of um, piece of the puzzle and the third i was talking about is linkages where i shared about the farming community um similarly so in mehsana as well for the atmyata project uh, lots of our community champions know that uh, it's very important to help people get ration cards or maybe provide access to an ngo that helps with livelihoods all of these are not tangential to mental health but as i was saying earlier mental health is really a development issue so similarly a third project in fact our first partner which is something called the i call helpline which is a national helpline uh, free of cost that is staffed by psychologists um in which they provide services in nine languages again that helpline has the capacity if someone is calling from kurnool district uh, and is talking about how maybe her husband beating her is affecting her mental health not only will she be given support on the call but she will also be given numbers of a social worker in her particular district or in the area that she lives in Yes. which is the other key key linkage because the moment that you know we talk about mental health just as psychology or as psychiatry we are actually doing a disservice to um, whoever needs support because it has to go beyond that especially in india and other countries maybe they have very you know built up welfare networks built up civil society systems but over here we really need to link people um so i think that's the third part of really replicability and scalability and that's something that i think we rely on in most of the programs that we fund that these are the kind of three ingredients that have to be there community uh, linkages to benefits to civil society and other kind of schemes and of course then linkages to an expert led mental health whether mm -hmm. it's psychiatry or clinical psychology as well as the medications that go with it 
Um, so Raj, uh, please tell us about the Hair For You campaign on Snapchat that you have started in COVID. Uh, what was the response of the campaign and how it is uh, uh, greatly benefited the youth or benefiting it? Yeah. So, you know, Snapchat, I think, was expanding in India and they reached out to us because uh, Snapchat, Instagram, all of these um, kind of online mediums have been very interesting places for young people to engage with and talk to, you know, they are talking about their own mental health, which is a positive sign, but there weren't enough, I think, trusted resources out there, which is why Snapchat reached out to us. Now, Snapchat did share uh, with MHI uh, some of the kind of, um, I would say, results of the campaign. And they had asked us to keep it confidential, but I will say that at least 10,000 users across Snapchat accessed for this particular campaign. Now, the reason for us doing it is because I think um, that there, there was a lack of, again, contextually correct information out there. Uh, and of course, for Indian young people, mental health is a very critical issue. India, Indian youth, um, actually are dying in suicide, dying by suicide in record numbers. It's the highest cause of death for Indian 15 to 29 year olds. And it is a problem that sorely needs to be addressed. Uh, and part of it is then to share resources to allow young people the agency to kind of pursue their understandings of mental health, to figure things out for themselves. Because of course, not everyone can access a mental health professional they are expensive, even in cities, even if you are English speaking, right? And that's not even counting the fact that a lot of parents or maybe older generations will have issues all of a sudden if a child goes to them, even an English speaking privileged urban, whatever child goes to them and says, I want to go to a therapist. Mm -hmm. It's unlikely to happen. So that's one of the ways in which actually a young person can engage with their mental health. That's also why we have helplines, not just the I call helpline, but, but we support a few other helplines because anonymity in India, especially it's changing slowly, uh, has been seen as quite important, uh, you know, for accessing mental health, especially for young people, young men, young women. So uh, the Snapchat, I think the other thing that the Snapchat campaign did was I think it did prompt quite a few other platforms as well to start thinking about how to I think uh, support mental health and this is as important because of uh, the the opposite also happens on these platforms by the way which is cyber bullying and lots of young people um, either are affected by it or take part in it so that's the other end of the coin and we did uh, put out a guide which I think Instagram took up and used uh, on their platform. But again, feel free to ask me more detailed questions on this if you'd like. Yes. One, one question that I have, uh, which is, uh, and that's why I'm butting in, sorry about it, Shipra. No, it's okay. But how do we, uh, so you're working across communities. Uh, mobile phone has really shaped the way and reshaped the way we communicate. So, you know, in tier two and tier three cities when TikTok came around and then TikTok was banned in that process for two and a half, three years, you had a bunch of very energetic, very um, interesting people who were telling different kinds of stories, which platforms like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook do not really you know, uh, apply. So uh, a, this is a very interesting thing that MHI is doing. How do we build platform agnostic uh, messaging, because when we talk about messaging now, we're still thinking in terms of text. You know, it's still a very prescriptive thing. You know, what I call the commandments, Bible commandment syndrome. You shall not do this and that and all of that. So A, have you really thought about it? And um, sort of a add on to this, how do we, because I'm interested in how MHI has been approaching it. So um, is there an atlas of anxiety that you've been able to look at that, you know, this is what it is, but anxiety is different things to different people at different times. 
So a two-fold question and then Shipta can get back to uh, her thing. Sure. Um, so this is a very interesting question on, you know, platforms or text. And we have been thinking about it a lot simply because, honestly, mental health is full of jargon, okay? And jargon that unless you actually work in mental health or you're part of the field, uh, it's quite impossible and who gets it really, right? So, uh, you know, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Is How do you make it more accessible, uh, how would you make it more accessible to someone who's blind? How would you make it more accessible to someone who's deaf? Uh, how do you create ways in which to engage? Um, and I think it's for that reason that, you know, we, again, we support a bunch of things, not just in terms of platform, but also on the ground. Um, one of our partners does this wonderful thing called Man Mela, where there are games around mental health, where there are actual uh, rituals that maybe are part of local traditions that have been kind of switched around with mental health messaging. So songs that maybe are just tinkered with a little bit and there are there is mental health messaging around those. A lot of community-based organizations that work in mental health actually already do this. And there is, let me tell you, an absolute richness of material, of work uh, that has happened in India on this topic, on very innovative and creative ways in which to communicate on mental health. So while I, I don't have answers in terms of actual tech, um, I, I do know that there are multiple ways to do this, not just in terms of video or in terms of spoken word or text, um, but also you know just on the ground, whether it's festivals or whether it's the Man Mela or games actually even that are used in different villages and towns, et cetera. And, you know, I, I can, I know that there's a video coming out on this in the next um, two weeks or so, which we'll be sure to share with uh, your team, right? So that's one. Now, second on uh, an atlas of anxiety. So how we approach it is we actually talk about unique life stressors or unique psychosocial stressors. So for different people, they can have different stressors. Uh, it may or may not lead to a diagnosable condition such as anxiety or depression. But then again, what is that diagnosis going to get most people? Forget someone like me. I'm like that top 0.001%. How do we look at working on different stressors? How do we look at common mental disorders? People who live with severe mental illness already will have those diagnoses. But if we are to truly address psychosocial stressors, uh, there are ways in which to plot this for different communities, uh, different, and, and we do do this across our programs, whether it's the, uh, you know, the helpline that I was talking about, or even one of our other partners, Anjali, who works in uh, mental institutions across West Bengal, uh, it's very easy to plot what a psychosocial stressor is. And of course, now if I have to connect it back to, you know, the COVID question, everyone spoke about anxiety, everyone knew what it was and how it was affecting them during COVID, right? Uh, whether people are using different words to describe it, whether the anxiety of someone who is a trafficking survivor is very different from someone uh, who is maybe about to lose their job due to maybe COVID related shutdowns. What is different and what is more important is to look at one, the triggers. And number two, what are the ways in which we can engage with this, not just in terms of like uh, traditional mental health, which is talk therapy or psychiatry, but what are the other linkages that can be provided to either of these two people? Right. That is pretty interesting. Uh, Shipra, I actually have another question, but I'm going to stop for now. Okay, I think Shipra has... So, uh, keeping in mind the age group of suicidal uh, persons, what are the new funding priorities for MHI and how can universities be a part of it? Right. So, very important question. And it was actually during COVID that, uh, you know, we started having these conversations in MHI and 
Uh, I think in the first year of COVID itself, just looking at what we were seeing in our work, we said that we have to actually have a very focused, concerted effort on suicide prevention uh, because our numbers are going to rise, right? So uh, we started off talking about it. I think in year two of COVID, we convened uh, two types of kind of working groups or discussion groups. One was actually experts who have worked on suicide prevention. And the other was people with lived experiences of suicidal ideation or a loss of a loved one due to suicide. And on the basis of that, and as well as other research, we came up with a report called Changing the Narrative. Now, this is free uh, to download on our website, and I won't go into the report. Uh, but part of this really was that, yes, there is stigma, and yes, awareness building, all that is fine. Okay, And we know that that has to be part of whatever is to be done. But in some senses, it's almost pointless to do awareness building or uh, working just on stigma if there are no services for people to talk to. I mean, I can go and build awareness everywhere, but if people don't have someone to talk to, what's going to happen, right? Um, so we launched what we call Alliance for Suicide Prevention. Um, and we invited, we hoped that more Indian funders would join in this effort because mental health is not as well funded in terms of philanthropy or CSR as some other areas. And we also invited people from civil society to do more suicide prevention. Now, because of lack of funding, uh, there aren't that many historically well-established programs on suicide prevention in the country. Second, because it was up until the Mental Health Care Act of 2017, it was actually illegal. Uh, so technically you could be charged if you tried to die by suicide. Right. Once the 2017 Act was passed, it was no more illegal, but uh, did do all police stations in the country know this? Do all judges and lawyers in courts know this? No. So one thing that we started doing was really strong awareness building in all of these institutions, whether it's judiciary, whether it's police, what are the provisions of the Mental Health Care Act and what should be done? Uh, in case you come across someone who has attempted suicide. That, that was, I think, uh, we started that actually pretty early on. We even have an app that anyone can download that our partner has made on the Mental Health Care Act. It's you know more accessible and anyone can use it really. Uh, the other thing was, now data on suicides is still collected as a crime indicator. So we knew that the other thing that we have to do is really work with the government so that we can have some policy action on suicide prevention. So one of the things that we did, I think it was maybe last year or the year before, we convened um, you know, some interested members of parliament and other politicians to sit in with us to formulate policies around suicide prevention. And I think in about a year or so, we had the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, which was launched by the government, which is a really welcome step, I think, in addressing suicide, because there are many, many different uh, policy ideas that can be used to engage with the idea of suicide. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, one of the, I think one of the world's best, we are, we are fortunate enough to have one of the world's best suicide prevention experts um, from India, and she really is. Uh, her name is Dr. Lakshmi, and she did a couple of very interesting things in Tamil Nadu, maybe around, I think, six, seven years ago. On suicides of young persons who are in a certain uh, standard in school, I think it was maybe ninth or 10th or 11th or 12th. She introduced, she got the government to introduce the idea of supplementary exams, which is if you fail in your boards, you can retake the exam. Mm -hmm. This in itself caused a huge dent in death by suicides of young people. So like a brilliant and simple policy solution. Does it require mental health professionals? Does it require more people to be trained as psychologists? No. Similarly, so with farmers. 
uh, in a certain district in Tamil Nadu where she set up a program that worked with village panchayats. The village panchayat would designate one kind of room uh, of maybe village hut or panchayat related hut where people would store pesticides, their own pesticides in lockers. So each family would have the pesticides they use in farming to be stored in lockers, which were kept under lock and key and used on the basis of sign out. The village was involved in this process. That also caused a huge dent in suicide rates because a lot of suicide is impulsive. And when given a chance to step back and think about it, people don't carry through with it. So the very, like, one little barrier to accessing the means of suicide, that is the pesticide or poison, actually affected farmer suicide rates. And again, it's very beautiful in its simplicity. So like I said previous, uh, it's not necessarily that our solutions for mental health lie only with psychiatry and psychology. Uh, and there are some very important, I think, uh, you know, ways in which policy can play a role uh, in doing this. So we did do this with politicians. And the third thing we did, of course, is civil society, uh, where we've launched programs for uh, civil society, which is not just mental health NGOs. We encourage NGOs that work on livelihood, that work on housing and shelter, that work on gender-based violence to actually do our suicide prevention course, which is in English and Hindi, so that they can start working on suicide prevention. Like I said previous, uh, where, but even though there's a history of working on mental health and very innovative community-based mental health programs in India, there is a very clear and discernible lack of those that work on suicide prevention, maybe because it was illegal. So we have to actually create more civil society and more NGO-based programs that work on this. And so that's the kind of third element of this, where we are actually training NGOs and not just mental health NGOs to start suicide prevention work. Okay. Ma'am, uh, uh, I have this question, like you should answer this question as well. How can universities be a part of it? So I, I think universities can be a part of it in some very important ways. One is, I, I'm, you know, you all know that uh, bullying and ragging is very much a part of culture. So how do you put policies in place? How do you make cultural change? Uh, most universities will tend to say, oh, our counselors are there, but uh, the flip side, and we have worked with a few universities, uh, the counselors are not trained adequately in which to deal with, uh, say, an LGBTQ student or a student who may be different, a student who may not speak English in a more polished manner. Uh, we all know that Dalit students are dying also at higher rates. Again, most counselors are not equipped to do affirmative work in universities. So one is the counseling bit. The other is, uh, it's not just the students who are part of bullying. Sometimes faculty is bullied or sometimes faculty does the bullying as well. So really we need to take a, a strong, hard look at our culture. Part of that is having a very strong grievance process in universities where you can put in a complaint and know that it will get heard without any repercussions to yourself. I think the, the larger, maybe more universal thing for universities is the sort of pressure that students are put under to exceed, to excel. Uh, what are the ways in which you can have maybe grading systems or different types of examinations or supplementary exams? I mean, that's university, but you know, our families, our neighborhoods, our joint families also play a role in putting an undue amount of stress on young people. Uh, and I mean, this really needs to change. It's a long-term cultural shift that has to happen. Uh, until which, of course, universities should be providing ways in which to do supplementary exams, etc. Thank you for that. So how does the MHI addresses the gaps in mental health services data, mental health services data and funding in India? with a specific fo uh, focus on marginalized communities? So, I mean, the focus is on marginalized communities because I shared with you what I said previously, yeah. our approach is 
when you build for the margins, everyone will be covered. If you build for the center, you're never going to reach the margin. So uh, we do this in a couple of ways. We focus on accessible, appropriate mental health services and support for marginalized communities by partnering with organizations and programs that foreground community-based mental health support, which must go beyond a symptom reduction approach and must work towards social inclusion via multiple pathways and via multiple referral linkages. So of course, like I said previously, this will be a little bit of a repetition, but the, this strong focus um, has to have services and support, not only provided by experts, but also by trained individuals from within communities. And this is done by foregrounding community voices and participation, but also really at by looking at how systemic barriers <clears throat> specific to particular contexts affect an individual's well-being, right? So, you know, some of the programs that we work on are on urban informal settlements. And by that, I mean, in Maharashtra, we say, Charles, I don't know where everyone is kind of, uh, you know, tuning in from, but uh, slum communities is the other, I would, I, I guess, more informal way to say it hilly regions, regions facing conflict like Manipur. And of course, we do work with farmers, victims of violence, acid attack survivors, LGBTQ community. So it's very important to, to kind of foreground which specific barriers affect each and every of these communities. And once we know that mental health support and linkages must address social, economic, and institutional exclusion that contributes to what we call psychosocial distress. Which means really all we are saying is that we are widening the ambit of what we understand as mental health to deal not just with the, I would say, overlying symptoms, but also uh, you know access to social safety nets, labor rights, food insecurity, etc. Now, alongside that, we also focus on advocacy with multiple sectors. Like I was saying, uh, government uh, is the way to really, you know, scale and provide services to more people. So there is that. Um, we also have other programs that work with judiciary, not just on the Mental Health Care Act, but for example, I, I like giving examples, so I'll continue to give those. Uh, but for example, in Maharashtra, we have family courts and within the family courts, you know, it's a very stressful area for not just petitioners, people who are part of a case, but also for the judges, the lawyers who work on these issues in our society. So, for example, we have counselors in each and every family court in Maharashtra, not just for the petitioners, but also for the judges and others, because we recognize that it is a particular site for mental distress, right? So that type of advocacy exists. And I mean, I, I, I can recount to you the judges who have said this is helpful. The reason that this program is actually spread throughout Maharashtra is on invitation of the judicial authority because we piloted it in two courts and they found it so useful that they themselves asked for it, right? Um, the other thing that we provide is technical support. So we have an MOU with the Bihar government where we do some stuff in Bihar. Uh, we are signing MOUs with a couple of other state governments. We work with the Department of um, Women and Children in Delhi uh, because they have a helpline so to train their counselors to provide psychosocial support in the helpline to provide other linkages, to work with Mahila Panchayat. So this all falls under advocacy and in terms of technical support to a range of different government services. Um, but I think the kind of third component is our capacity building work on mental health. Um, and that's simply because, you know, we do believe that mental health is intersectional and intersectoral. Um, so, like I said, we have courses on suicide prevention. We have a course on actual community-led mental health work. We have different courses for our partner organizations as well as other NGOs who want to understand different unique life stressors. Um, and of course, I think our most famous course is for mental health professionals on 
being queer affirmative in terms of counseling practices. Now, this is our biggest course. That's the course that we started our training work with. And we've trained about 550 mental health professionals in India to be LGBTQ affirmative. Again, you know, there was a law, uh, the old British law that was struck down by courts, I think about five to six years ago. After that, uh, there has been nothing. And obviously, curricula the world over has not kind of kept up uh, with more progressive thinking around this. And so we launched a course. Now that course, like all of our other courses, is designed by LGBTQ mental health professionals themselves. So, you know, by the community that it represents. Mm -hmm. And um, that has seen, again, some quite a few changes, including advising different courts, such as the Madras High Court, on um, different cases and some landmark judgments have also kind of come out of that. So... I think that's really how we work on, um, I think, mental health for marginalized communities. But I'll give one more example. And I think this is really a testament to young people. During COVID, along with a couple of other partner organizations, we launched um, a small program called Youth Cares, where we trained 30 youth uh, in certain communities, obviously not urban and privileged communities to provide support to their peers and gave them linkages to different types of services. Uh, and we gave them a phone line. Now this resulted in, in a period of two months, each youth at, had spoken to at least 500 people and not just young people, but other community members and had actually created resources or linked people to many different kinds of resources. Um, and, you know, they did this because they wanted to volunteer to do it. Uh, they were an important part of their community when they did it. And I mean, it created change for a lot of people. So it doesn't have to be something massive, doesn't have to be something expert, doesn't have to be something hugely fancy. Uh, but it's, it's very critical to look at what we have. And we do have, uh, especially in India, the moment... I think we step out of the idea that mental health is an individual process. And, you know, a lot of Western literature, a lot of Eurocentric literature does say so. So, and, you know, we've copy pasted a lot of it, unfortunately. But I, I really strongly believe that community led things in India is a, a very powerful way in which to engage with the idea of mental health. So does MHI also faces uh, data issues? like yes yes i mean that you know there are massive data gaps not just in terms of suicide you know it's collected by crime data uh, but really even in terms of funding mental health there are gaps even in terms of just figuring out um, what exists out there who is suffering there is literally i, I think worldwide this data issue exists for mental health. It's not just India at all. Um, so of course in India, there isn't that much. Uh, and I think again, partly it, it can come down to the fact that even when it comes to government, unfortunately, in terms of budgetary allocations, the spends have gone to only two major institutions, NIMHANS and the mental health hospital in Tejpur, which is in Assam. Uh, so we actually need far more um, out there. We need to look very critically at our spends. Even if I take that one facet, I'll tell you one data point which will kind of change many people's lives. Uh, like I was telling you earlier, uh, you know, we have some provisions in Indian law. We have the DMHP, which is the District Mental Health Plan. We have uh, obviously the MHCA. Now, by DMHP, uh, you know, each state is given a DMHP allocation. Most states will not know what their allocation is, whether they've spent it at all. Uh, and for the states that we work with, we're actually able to go back, find and say that, you know, actually you've not spent any of your money for the last X amount of years. Imagine that. So if I had all this data about DMHP spends, if I had the data about which states by law have set up the state mental health authority 
I would be able to do a whole lot more different things. I would be able to provide, you know, technical support to state state authorities to say, okay, you can allocate this in X, Y, Z places. But we don't have that. And the states also don't seem to have it on their fingertips. But just even that much, even these two indicators would be a huge change for a lot of people. Yes, that's so. Do you think, so, uh, Raj, in this context, do uh, <clears throat> you think the definition of trauma, like when we, when we look at uh, any kind of mental illness and now you have been talking about you know taking it away from psychiatry but let's come to psychiatry for a minute and there is the dsm-5 the yes. process is on for the next panel dsm any dsm is a huge enterprise right they spend a lot of time and there is something called as ptsd um every day in india is challenging primarily because you brought up something very interestingly which is heat right we don't know what heat islands are doing to us. But that's just not there. There's not enough work done in India. We don't know what minor accidents are doing to you on the road. I mean, you forget about the accidents that kill, but accidents that leave you slightly injured. So, uh, and this is a question that uh, has been uh, something that <clears throat> a lot of people have been grappling with. But how do you come to a definition of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, in a country where stresses and stresses are, you know, multiplicated and they just change on a daily basis? So is there some kind of work that's been happening? Is there some sort of a conversation MHI is opening with say universities, but also connecting it to the DSM conversation in the West? So this is a very interesting question. And, you know, whenever it comes to DSM questions, I always like to give the first the history of the DSM. Um, you know, it was in Europe that the first asylums were made. Um, and they were not made by doctors. Okay, I'm not talking physical health doctors. They were made by entrepreneurs. They were made by businessmen. Now, the, the foundation of DSM is when these businessmen went to all these asylums in France, in England, and interviewed the people who are in the asylums. Now, who was put in the asylums? Uh, women who were pregnant before a wedding, people who had epilepsy. And uh, this is my favorite example in India, especially. In the UK, they used to put people in a mental asylum because uh, they had decided to be vegetarian. So... Now imagine, now that is a legacy of what the DSM is built on. They also, uh, you know, they, they came up with a bunch of different things that were more about social norms rather than about illness. Uh, so for example, one of the main guys who started the DSM way back when um, had said that Jewish people are mentally ill. I mean, he was from uh, Germany and was very much, I guess, part of the whole Hitler Nazism outfit. Similarly, so in America, where they said black slaves are mentally ill when they try to run away, right? So we can see how, in that sense, mental health has been used more to talk about social norms rather than to talk about illnesses. Now, that is not saying that illnesses do not exist. They very much exist. And, you know, despite me saying we need to de-emphasize psychiatry, I take psychiatric medication every day. And, you know, that is that. So there is clearly a role for it but coming to your you know second question on trauma and especially in a in a country like india yes where daily life may be hard um i think there are so many conversations around trauma and it's it's actually quite a battlefield um and honestly i don't think we've figured out too many ways in which to have conversations about it as a whole uh, but for MHI, I'll tell you, we have conversations around PTSD, and this is more, I, I think, uh, I would say just in terms of the time that we have worked on it, in terms of disasters, okay, where the, the effects of PTSD when it comes to environmental disaster is, or any other types of disaster are very, very high. Um, and just, you know, just in the way that disasters are dealt with again, uh, you know, you have some more physical relief, you may have, I don't know, 
someone giving you money for three months, etc. But you know, the mental health aspect of it is not taken care of at all. Whereas we know, and there is data to show that people who have been through a disaster, uh, and in particular environment or climate disaster, suffer PTSD for at least seven to 10 years after the incident. And not just that, to the extent that it hampers with daily activity. So one thing to do is to you know, kind of take the most extreme example of it, which is kind of what we've been working on. And how do you prevent that type of stuff? The other is to look at survivors of trafficking, to look at uh, victims of violence, because there are also very high levels of PTSD there. But honestly, this is a very important conversation. It's a, uh, it's a can of worms in that sense and not something that you know, we have grappled with in the larger context, you are absolutely bang on. But um, there is also, I think, a movement now in the West, which I think personally, I'm, uh, I don't yet have the information, I, I don't have the discourse, which is called trauma informed mental health. Right. And again, this is something coming from the West, but what are the ways in which we are experiencing it, understanding it in our contexts? All of this is um, as yet kind of unknown territory for me. Uh, but in light of, I would say, more recent work as well as what we have seen, just in terms of disasters. And again, India, South Asia is facing the brunt of uh, kind of climate change. And research has shown so apparently about five percent of people from Bangladesh who suffered I think floods in I think 2020 five percent of their population uh, face suicide uh, ideations two percent or 2.4 percent actually acted on it and that's a pretty big number so again you know we are going to see such things in India but I don't have a very good answer for you I'm afraid Right. No, thank you. I mean, that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, sort of a follow up in a in a different direction, if you will. Um, gut health has been very important in Indian, uh, you know, food traditions. And there is a question that I received from one of the members of our board. Um, you know, so gut health has been prioritized in India. For example, let's say you talk about Gujarati food. Now, Gujarati food, you have a lot of um, you have food classes or food groupings that kind of cater to specific gut flora. And now it's been proved by research. And you have that in different Indian dishes. With the coming of the, um, let's say, a, lot, a different kind of palate, food palate, that conversation around gut health has changed. And now research is happening in the West, and now coming to India, saying, you know what, gut health is very important for mental health. But Linking it back to one of the earlier statements you made, uh, how do you talk about gut health to a person uh, who's earning less than 100 rupees a day, right? So how do you get that conversation going? And how do you talk to a person 14, 15, 16, who doesn't want to give up on big smoking burgers? How do you have that conversation? Right. So... So I, I, I can share material with you later, but um, again, one of our partner organizations uh, called Bapu Trust, which works in five big urban slum communities in Pune, they started off doing nutrition related to mental health over 10 years ago. And they have materials, they have talks, they have corner addas, uh, on nutrition done by the community health workers in multiple languages. Uh, and it is very much, uh, I think, a part or a focal approach of uh, how they work uh, with those you know, who may be distressed, but not just the person who may be distressed or needing the support, but also the families, also the neighborhood. So I'll, I'll give you one example actually from Bapu Trust. Uh, there was a lady who was living in one of these urban slum communities and the house, the, the I, I don't know what the word is in Hindi, but uh, like the jhopdi, I don't know, uh, someone can translate what jhopdi is, looked like very ramshackle, the windows were broken, there was no light, 
and she would shout at people if anyone came close over time the the bapu workers built some rapport with her they were able to talk to her all of her family members had died she was suffering from uh, a mental illness so obviously they managed to arrange uh, you know visits to the psychiatrist got her the meds got her the ration card got her electricity other than that they spoke to all the neighbors who lived around her and set up a system of care with the neighbors so that even if she was unable to get the nutritious food for herself one or the other neighbor would look out and prepare it for her or would inform the community based worker uh, so that's just one example but this i mean this type of work already exists in a lot of our community based programs out there to talk about health and nutrition you know for mental health and uh, i mean i i wish that it kind of expands or spreads uh, not all of our partners do it i know that not even like mainstream mental health or urban fancy mental health does it but you are absolutely right there are ways in which to do it it does need to spread more now in terms of young people and burgers uh, that's a much harder question for me to answer simply because it hasn't kind of entered our priority scales honestly um yeah i i i don't have a good answer for no, you know, that's absolutely fine that i'm that. Look, uh, i have a uh, one comment and one small absolutely question. please please go on yeah. so raj thank you very much it was very um uh, very nice uh, hearing from you and like i was saying earlier that uh, uh, this issue is uh, very personal uh, to my heart and uh, i'm saying that because uh, my daughter is uh, also has suffered from mental health issues and she is a very uh, high achieve uh, achievement uh, uh, person she did her uh, md um, uh, medicine from uh, harvard and she was uh, acting surgeon general of california state uh, um, at the age of 35 and uh, so mm -hmm. it was at that time that she in a big meeting in la uh, a full full house she uh, quote unquote came out and uh, shared that she had uh, suff and suffers from uh, or had suffered from uh, bipolar disorder and uh, after that uh, she has been uh, she does many other things but uh, she has taken on herself to do advocacy role for uh, uh, mental health because uh, um, she uh, she wrote an article uh, op-ed in la times where uh, her uh, major theme was that uh, and uh, i always quote her lines that uh, stigma festers in dark and scatters in light and uh, so she uh, uh, and she of course uh, i'm sharing that because i have permission from her to share it uh, but when the uh, my op-ed came out so i was very surprised to see that a lot of people got in touch with me um, more than a dozen uh, who had children with mental health issues and they had never shared that with anyone else but uh, since uh, they thought that i have shared this they came back to me and they wanted to get some advice so i think uh, this uh, issue of uh, stigma is a big one uh, it's uh, all over the world uh, stigma is there but uh, in india because the way we've treated uh, mental health issues ki pagal hai ye to aur pagal khane mein jao aur is tarah ki or all the our jokes about uh, mental health uh, are such that you know no one wants to admit that they have issue uh, not realizing that if uh, unless they admit they can't do much about it and of course uh, your uh, point about uh, we not having services is very valid uh, but at the same time the beginning has to be done by admitting that you have a problem or uh, admitting to uh, i have some relatives who have a, a child who is on borderline uh, mental health issues in terms of paranoia and i when i tell him that uh, you know you need to show it to a, a professional they they don't know it hota rehta hai ho jayega theek ho jayega apne aap ho jayega they don't want to admit it first is you know you don't want to admit anything 
uh, is wrong. And secondly, you don't want to share it with others. So I think that's a big problem. I think one has to do something about it. And I've sent a uh, copy of my uh, op-ed to you uh, by on chat yes. message. Yes, I whenever saw it. I clicked time. on it and saved it. Yes. Yeah. So whenever you have time, just to have a, a read. I've, of course, referred to Deepika Padkon, how she has done a great service to uh, this field by uh, admitting and coming out and, of course, doing uh, wonderful work from uh, with her sister on uh, LLFIF. Uh, so that that's one. And uh, just uh, uh, one more issue that my daughter, uh, because she does the advocacy, she has a, um, I think uh, she runs a website. So I may ask her to get in touch with you. Maybe she might interview you for her blog. And uh, so she, uh, I'll put you in touch. Amog, if you can share the email, I'll uh, e-connect them. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I think my question was, uh, uh, you know, my feeling, and of course, there is a lot of uh, uh, research to show that uh, social media is uh, uh, also a big cause of anxiety and, uh, in fact, depression and mental health issues among young young people because they see that everyone else is having a great life and uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, not correct in many cases they, uh, in with compared to them. And there is uh, this pressure to be... Uh, seeing life in a different way and putting something out and then waiting how many likes you've got, how many, uh, whether people have uh, accepted you or not. I think that also has put a lot of pressure on young people and something has to be done uh, about that as well, Raj. Hmm. I mean, I, I um, thanks hmm. for sharing so much, of, you know, about your daughter and uh, it's... Uh, amazing to see what she has done and I, I'll completely agree with you. The very fact that she has to think about and mm -hmm. then make a statement when it should be something as natural, even when it comes to medical doctors shows how kind mm -hmm. of ingrained the stigma is and that's I think one of the biggest issues in mental health that if you have a mental health condition, it's seen as an individual failing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you are seen as less than and I, I think that's the big problem and people like Deepika really have uh, made such a change um, and you know it would be great because she does it best she'll do it better than I ever could uh, which is why I hope that you know they continue to do the work that they're doing um, now on social media I completely agree with you it is very much a double-edged sword mm. um, you know people are looking online looking at their peers looking what they are up to, you know, doing all sorts of things for Instagram likes or Facebook likes, no, not Facebook, Instagram likes and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think it also ends up actually being quite isolating for young people. Um, they may be doing that rather than going out and doing other things. Uh, I would like to hope that it is slightly, that young people in India are slightly better off in that regard than people abroad. But again, uh, I don't believe we have enough data, we have enough research for the Indian context, honestly. Um, it's one of the, again, weak data points. We don't know how Indian young people are using it, how Indian young people are affected. And I'm really not a fan of uh, copy pasting it from the West. I think, uh, Shipra, over to you. Or Dr. Bhushan, do you have uh, any- No, no, I'm fine. Okay. Shipra, over to you. Yes. So, uh, Raj, we are already running out of time and there are a lot of questions from my team and the other uh, participants. So I would love uh, to uh, 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 everybody to ask the questions they have. Um, I think uh, my teammate uh, Neeti Gautam has a question. So I Sanjana would like wants to ask a question. Ma'am, Sanjana, ma'am. Sandhya, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Please, ma'am. Go for it. Uh, Raj, I think it is really, really um, touching as well as uh, wonderful to know the kind of work that is happening and you're taking a lead around. Uh, because this is definitely an under, uh, very well, uh, I mean, very under understood area. Um, I have a mother who's probably borderline bipolar and like you know uh, Indu was saying family basically said yeah, you know her temp uh, temperament just swings a little bit 
But what we don't realize is, uh, I think, fortunately, because of uh, proper, um, let's say, food and health, uh, exercise, it was kept under control and we didn't really kind of understand that. But I think that leads, as we get older, the precipitation of dementia and other things make it even worse. And we don't realize the correlation of all of, you know, how, just like you keep your physical health when you're young and as you get older, that's also going to get even worse. And if I go back to the larger macro picture, India is going to have one of the largest, uh, you know, aging population. And if we don't understand the mechanics of how we take care of ourselves, I think it's going to be um, really tough. And I think I really love the fact that you're uh, you're going about it without trying to do a copy paste to the West, because we do have systems which can kind of make us far more aware, like you know the our food and the correlations on what foods help and in which context. I think the more we're able to correlate it, I think that'll be really helpful. Um, I think one thing that um, Amogji mentioned, it isn't the PTS, uh, you know, you have the post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome. And I think it is worthwhile seeing how we can improve um, more self-care and knowledge, at least among those who can learn it. Because, for example, I know I was ill 25 years ago, 28 years ago. I still struggle to go see a doctor. I almost find it paralyzing. So I suspect There'd be hundreds of us. And if you're able to get, start off with self-care so that by the, you you know, yes, you may still need to go to a doctor or professional to get that. I think, so anything that any of us can help uh, on your journey, uh, I think would be more than happy to. I uh, would also like to learn, um, is there something that you're doing in those spaces? You know, taking care so that by the time people age, how can we prevent it? Same thing around uh, the PTSD. How can we kind of support it so that it's not actually impacting productivity? Because I suspect it impacts productivity at the workplace as well, pretty actively. So, um, you know, very relevant comments, especially on our aging population. And it's really, it's one of those areas, just like suicide, where there's much less out there. Uh, and we're very kind of, in the very first steps of looking at it, um, you know, as an organization. And the only thing that we've done so far, which is not aging related per se, but we have really started working on palliative care. And I think the next step for us is dementia, aging. Again, uh, there's not much out there in terms of, I think, civil society work. With larger mental health, there was, and so there was enough for us to learn, to work on, and to kind of reframe or redo or support to scale up. Uh, not so with this particular uh, kind of, not this subject area, but it, it is absolutely critical and you are absolutely right. And, you know, all of us in India better pull up our socks very soon on this. Right now on um, PTSD and kind of, methods for self uh, I do believe it's very important and you know one of the things that we do focus on is the agency of people who require support or who want to engage on their mental health now that's critical and what are the ways in which we can um, increase or support or empower someone's agency with which to address and engage with their mental health so it can be done in a couple of different ways a lot of our community-based programs do uh, have trained community workers who then train people on how to do different actuation exercises, breathing exercises, other types of exercises. And believe me, these are done in urban slum community corners. These are done um, in villages. And I can, you know, I'll share a couple of videos later on on mail and you'll see that there are some very incredibly effective methods with which people can use to engage with their own self. Like I said, we don't need a psychiatrist and a psychologist for every instance, right? And, and those may be necessary, absolutely. Uh, but it's also very important to give people their own agency in order to deal with their health, be it mental or physical. Um, so there are enough programs like that out there. I think in terms of PTSD, one of the maybe more interesting examples, again, is, and we've done this in a couple of districts in Orisha, where we looked at communities that face floods and cyclones 
frequently. You know, it's just where they live. That's just a factor of their life, right? And how to build community response systems so that people don't get PTSD. Who in the community uh, is able to actually provide some mental health support, but also link to, be it panchayat, be it link to the district collector to get support services in not just mental health, but other support services in, in place so that people are not suffering that much. And of course, the key thing with this is that the moment I put it squarely in a community, that community person knows that, oh, this person living three huts up the hill, she has a uh, walking disability, she'll need help to come down. Right. I don't need to then give money to like Action Aid India who will take them three, four weeks by the time the disaster is over. Right. So, uh, you know, that's one way to look at it. Um, but uh, again, like I was saying, a lot of work needs to be done. Um. <clears throat> one of the things that. Thank uh, you. Yeah, sure, sure. One of the things that uh, is fascinating about all of this is that, uh, so I'm an economist. Professionally, we are paid to be skeptics of everything under the sun, right? So, uh, but there is this new thing that, I mean, when I say new, 50 years old now, uh, called behavioral economics. So, and in India, a lot of organizations are kind of playing around with it. So working with it, trying to, but one problem is that you know, they are doing experiments, the experiments don't scale up. Has MHI done any uh, work on using behavioral economics for sending a message of working? And does that work? Because I'm actually looking at it from replicability point of view. Uh, because I am, uh, for some of my sins, a health economist of the behavior variety. But um, I don't see the replicability in India that well. Uh, and there are many wonderful organizations. Uh, there's one based in Ashoka, there's one based in Bangalore, but I just don't see that happening. Have you guys worked with it? Have you been able to find something from it? Uh, we haven't, the answer is no, we haven't worked with uh, any such organization. And I, I think partly it's because we haven't been approached by any such organization, uh, but no. Not really. And I mean, just to, again, give you give you an example of MHI per se and where we are in our journey, there's a lot that we haven't done. Um, simply because for the first, I think two to three years until 20, uh, until end of 2018, it was just me and the person who's now the chief advisor of MHI and she is a mental health professional. There were just the two of us. And so in, just in the past, I would say three to four years, we've you know, actually had a team and we've actually grown big, but for the longest time, it was literally just uh, two people, at least, you know, for the first three years on. So uh, in that sense, you know, we're quite, I think, early in our journey and there are lots of, there's still a lot of work for us to be done. Right. So that'll be pretty interesting. Um... Uh, that Thank you. Thank you, Rajmari Wala, Shipra, Moksa for this session. Uh, my question to you, Raj, would be like, what are the most effective ways to promote mental health and well-being in the workplace, in the workplace culture? And how can we create a culture of awareness and support within our colleagues or within our organization? Thank you. So I think um, we have done a certain amount of work on workplace mental health, be it the for-profit workplace or the non-profit workplace. Um, if I have to name one critical ingredient, leadership has to lead from the front. Okay, which means that, for example, at MHI, I will tell the team, this is the mental health issue I live with. Because I live with this issue, I will need X, Y, and Z from you in order to do my work properly. Now, once I do that, the rest of the team is able to, of course, articulate their own needs uh, and give it gives them the agency to do that. But it also sets a tone for how important mental health is treated in your organization. So I, I do strongly believe that we have to lead. I mean, the leader of the organization has to take this up personally, which also means that vulnerability is not a bad word and you have to be OK showing it. Apart from that, uh, there has to be an accommodations policy in place. And, um, you know, we have one on our website, you can take a look at it, which essentially says that, uh, you know, you can in 
disclose a mental health disability or any other type of disability. And what it does is we will change the system for you in order to do your work to the best of your ability, right? The moment we start having open conversations, we are moving beyond the idea of just EAP. Does everyone know what EAP is? It's um, employee, employee. I've forgotten what the full form of EAP is, but it's essentially making a helpline available to employees. The other thing is really looking at the workplace structure and culture and how it may or may not cause stress. What are the preventive factors? What are the protective factors right. in that particular workplace? And of course, the other way that we do it is we ask people to take like an approach of looking at the ecosystem. So if you work in a manufacturing industry, what overall are the stressors of the sector? What are the stressors of maybe your particular organization? And then, of course, what are the stressors that an individual may face if that person has, say, migrated from... I don't know, Bareilly to Delhi, all of a sudden, are they adjusting okay? Do they need a buddy? So there are ways in which to cut this question. And I, I really believe that it should be broken down like this. And, you know, the resource is there on our website um, for both for-profit workplaces and non-profit workplaces. But I, I think it the work must go beyond just saying that we have set up some free counseling for you and some Friday morning fun activity. It has to go beyond that. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, Farheen, you have a question. Why don't you uh, come in and out and uh, spell it, please? We have uh, questions from Kushi. Also, Kushi's question has been answered, Shipra. It's about the Kupta question. Farin, why don't you go ahead, please? Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Shipra, for uh, moderating this session. And thank you, ma'am, for the insightful discussion. Uh, I've gotten uh, I have a list of questions right now, but I think I'll hold off for to start with one, which is, uh, do you think, this is my assumption currently, uh, most of the work in psychology in India uh, or, and that's happening on ground in academic realm, do you think they mix? Do you think uh, uh, whatever is happening on field and what is being what is being done in academic uh, places, do you think they uh, work together? And people, uh, when we talk about uh, um, uh, on ground health uh, community workers like these who are sort of problem solving at local context, don't they need to be involved in these uh, academic work? How do you, for example, training them must be really, uh, really uh, hard. I can't even imagine the curriculum uh, that you must be uh, uh, modifying, uh, always uh, have to modify uh, depending on the region as well. So my question is, how uh, well do you think academic and the practicing uh, spaces in India are currently uh, handle and yeah so i mean it'll surprise you to know that like some of the the work that we do and some of the community workers that are trained mm -hmm. require seven days of like full seven days of training and then refresher courses every wow. few weeks right mm -hmm. so that there's that one thing i think the second thing and it's a very valid point um it would actually be very interesting and I think it would be very helpful for those who are studying in academic places to learn from and hear from those who are working on the ground. Mm. Uh, because there is a practical, there is a diverse element to the work that is done on the ground that students in our institutions do not see at all. In one sense, mm. they've been, uh, again, trained for urban English speaking certain class privileged individuals and so it's very important if they are to actually uh, kind of expand the boundaries of what they know and learn mm -hmm. from those on the field I think the other thing is that unfortunately in certain subjects within mental health um, there, there needs to be more of a public health approach like suicide for example suicide is very much a public health issue um, and so we really need to look at, uh, and this is not just India specific, let me be clear. I think mm. in many places in the world, 
mental health curricula has not really caught up, honestly, uh, to mm. answer and engage with the challenges of our times. Uh, and so this is something that really needs to be done to take that public health approach, to take a more intersectional and intersectoral approach uh, to mental health, honestly. Um, but there are, there are quite a few programs of a variety, actually, that help to train what you would call lay people or what is mm. called in maybe more uh, like technical terms, task shifting. Uh, there are a variety. There is youth mental health first aid. There is mental health first aid. There are like suicide prevention courses. So those may not take a lot of time, but I think the criticality of those courses is how well they are made for that particular context. Again, I don't think like necessarily getting some international cert youth mental health certification from somewhere may be entirely uh, applicable to our context. Got it. Uh, so just another uh, follow-up to this would be why do you think there's a disconnect within the uh, organization, civil society level? Uh, why are they not sort of publishing their uh, work a lot more? Uh, it could help uh, different other uh, regions also adapt or to their context, right? So I think, uh, you know, the answer to this is actually more of a funding answer, which is uh, mental health is really underfunded again not just in India, but everywhere through the world. Okay, hmm. be it underfunding from philanthropy, underfunding from CSR, or underfunding from government, which means hmm. that if I look at civil society in India that has done um, a lot of the mental health work historically, uh, a lot of the organizations are not just there anymore because they've lost the funding. Second, because they are doing the work on the ground, they don't have the resources to actually sit and publish research papers. I mean, I, I'll tell you again, I think we had approached at least three to four of the organizations that we worked with. We said, you're doing wonderful work. Why aren't mm. you publishing things? Why aren't you sharing this work? We'll mm. give you research budgets for this. We will pay for it all. Just go ahead and do it. And for many of these organizations, it just took them two to three years even to set something like this up. So this is more of a, a tackle capacity issue. Well. Mm. But it's a capacity issue, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sure. Uh, may I go ahead with my other question? Is no, that yeah, let's let's uh, slow it down for a bit. All right. There might be other people who might have questions. Uh, Got it. Over to you. Thank you so much. Do we have other questions? Uh, I have just received a question from somebody uh, who's been watching it. Uh, and the person in question is an architect. So the question is, the architectural spaces that are coming up now in India, they are not really designed with uh, mental well-being in mind, especially the corporate buildings. Is there some sort of a conversation that uh, you know, uh, institutions or organizations like MHI can have with professional architects and the bodies thereof? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm I sure that conversations can be had. Whether MHI is the best uh, organization to have these conversations, I'm not so sure. But, you know, increasingly in the West, um, mental health professionals are writing out what, what are called nature prescriptions, which is to say, go out and spend X time doing in the greenery or go out and spend X time doing gardening. Um, and, you know, those, those are very valid. I think those are very critical. Those are also very good, in my opinion, ways in which to engage with climate crises and to engage with our policy and advocacy um, lenses when it comes to structures and systems. But uh, as far as I know, these are not kind of conversations that have been had. And I'll say not just about mental health, but also about, I mean, I wonder, it would just be interesting for me because I'm interested in history. How long did it take for office buildings to have daycares or creches? You know, and how, again, part of conversations, again, around office buildings and far more pressing ones, actually, are the fact that how many office buildings 
have ramps? How many office buildings have Braille on their lift? Uh, are bathrooms accessible to everyone in office buildings? And I have spoken now to enough women who say that because we were the first woman in my office, there was no women's toilet, right? So I think uh, I think there can be lots of interesting conversations to be had around architecture and inclusion. But again, I, I don't know if MHI is the right one to be having these with architects. Right, absolutely. So I think that's the question answered. My job here is just a postman. So I'm doing that. Um, I think uh, it's over to uh, Dr. Bhushan for uh, kind of uh, bringing this to a close. We have uh, been, we are only left with five minutes of our allotted time. Time has really flown by. Uh, Dr. Bhushan, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Raj. It was uh, uh, really very uh, nice to hear from you. And I'm really impressed by the, uh, the all the work that you've done at a relatively young age and uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, I uh, do believe that uh, there's a lot to be done in this space and uh, what you've done is remarkable, but uh, I think uh, uh, work is still starting. So I think I hope uh, you will continue this and uh, we'll uh, have more uh, to share uh, in terms of not only doing work uh, where you're doing, but uh, all over India. And thank you again for your time. Um, thank you all so much for uh, spending so much time discussing mental health. Clearly, I mean, I can talk about it all the time, but mm -hmm. thank you all for your patience and, you know, real engagement with these issues. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks thank a lot. And exchange of ideas about mental health. This concludes a very informative session. And thank you, Asia Board, my fellows, and other respected guests for joining us today and making this Sense Maker a success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Please call me Raj. And if you need any links, just <laughs> email me. I've put some in the chat. Yeah. Sure. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks a lot for the links. Goodbye. Thank Please so take much. care. Bye.